everybody. Hello, everybody. Hi, whoop, whoop. You all had lunch, so you've got no excuse now. I need high energy. Um, so hello and welcome back um, after what's been already an amazing day. I love these events. Um, it's always a great opportunity to learn about an area of science or technology that you don't really know much about, and I always leave these events feeling inspired. So it's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you for that introduction as well. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about coexisting alongside wildlife. That was never really my focus of research um, going into natural history and, and as a scientist, but um, it's kind of just come about through through experience, I guess, and my combined um, career. So I want to start perhaps by introducing myself to you properly. So um, I'm actually a biologist first, so I'm a biologist and wildlife presenter, but biology is my real passion. That's always what I've wanted to do for my career. And I have a few areas of specialism, um, one of which is entomological, so ladybird larvae. Exciting, right? Yeah. I spent a year looking at how ladybird larvae sense the world. They use these spinal projections, possibly, um, to have an electrosensitive um, sense, essentially, and learn about their environment. All of you looking at me like, thank goodness she's not speaking about that for the next 15 minutes. Um, but yeah, that was um, a large part of my master's degree. And now, of course, natural transition. I'm going on to learn about elephants and elephants. And um, I'll come on to that because I'm looking mainly at the relationship between us and elephants out in Kenya. Um, but aside of my research career, I am very lucky because I do get to travel all over the world and see some pretty amazing animals in some pretty remote places. So as already mentioned by Matt, um, yeah, I've worked on uh, BBC Two alongside amazing, inspiring conservationists and biologists like Chris Packham. Um, I've worked on that Geo and, um, and CBBC, and now I am a host on BBC Earth Unplugged YouTube channel. Hands up, how many people subscribe to that YouTube channel? Okay, that's not enough, right? Everyone get your phones out, here we go. Um, I'm joking, but it is a great channel. It's a science and education channel. Um, it's really, really great to just learning about all areas of science. Point being, I feel extremely lucky to be able to learn about the natural world in the way that I do. Going to these amazing places, meeting these animals face to face, um, really a dream come true. Sounds peachy, right? Well, this is our first problem because it's very easy, I think, you know, as I've just done to you, I've presented to you this romantic and this wonderful image of what it's like to be me or live, um, you know, be a biologist or be a scientist or work in natural history documentary uh, filmmaking. And as natural history filmmaking has gone on, that's been the primary focus of what we uh, have been putting out there. So trying to inspire a wider audience about the natural world and get them to care, right? So of course we're going to document the biggest, the boldest, um, the most amazing research stories out there to inspire a wider audience. But to be honest, that's not the reality of my job and it's not the reality of the world that we live in today and the future generations will live in. So it's really, at the moment, a bit of a struggle between coexisting um, with wildlife between humans and all types of wildlife, no matter where you are in the world, this issue of human-wildlife conflict is prevalent across the world. And maintaining this symbiotic relationship, so definition, symbiotic relationship, it's taken from someone at Princeton University. It's a relationship that is essential to many organisms and ecosystems, providing a balance that can only be achieved by working together. That would be the ideal. And in learning about human-wildlife conflict, I'm inspired and constantly intrigued by the new ways that people, scientists, are trying to mitigate this conflict. Um, we actually see, it's completely realistic. We see symbiotic relationships in the natural world all the time. The leopard sea cucumber, you know this relationship with the pearlfish and the, no, do you, you don't, you're looking at me very confused. The one where the pearlfish lives in the anus of the sea cucumber. It's a serious, it's great, it's actually quite a journey. The pearlfish has to like propel itself into the anus of the sea cucumber so it can live there and it gets better, right? Because did you know sea cucumbers breathe through their butts? Right, so it's that symbiotic relationship. This, is, this isn't going down quite as well as I'd hoped. So we're going to move on. Um, how excited was I when I found my first sea cucumber? Because obviously it's an amazing symbiotic relationship. Anyway, moving very quickly on. My point is, it's not completely unrealistic to think of this uh, management of um, relationship between humans and, and wildlife. Maybe not taking direct advice off the sea cucumbers. Um, yeah, that'd be a bit dodge. So starting with my first 
case study, my first experience. So the relationship between people and elephants, and you're all very familiar with problems around this relationship. And most of you will probably be thinking of one thing. What's the first thing that pops up in your head? I, yeah, I was so poaching, absolutely, so poaching. What if I was to tell you that in East Africa, particularly in Kenya, the main problem is not poaching at all? Forget poaching. It is, of course, a prevalent problem. Back in 2010 to 2012, there was the um, poaching crisis where 100,000 elephants were poached for their ivory um, in East Africa. What if I was to tell you the main problem at the moment is direct conflict between people and elephants? So I went from January to around March time, I went out to a place called Laikipia. It's a county called Laikipia. Kenya is one of the fastest growing places for human population. There's um, about a million more people every single year. It's just rapidly increasing. Um, and what this means is that this whole landscape is becoming a real mosaic of different types of land use. So areas where all these elephants would roam freely in all these wild spaces, right, are now becoming replaced and really fragmented with farmland or private ranches. So as an elephant is making its migration, as it has done for years and years, this habitat is now disappearing. And it's been replaced with people. And in place of that land is now farms. So these people have these areas of farmland that they need to grow to feed their families, um, crops essentially, to, to basically sustain themselves and their, and their livelihoods. But when I was there, this picture is really emotive and, is, and actually is the picture that took me to Kenya. Um, I chased down this photographer and I said, I need you to tell me this story. And that's who I connected with out in Kenya. And then I went to work with um, him and the conservation organization out there. But this picture is a story of three bull elephants. They made their way down this river at night time. They went into this village and raided the Shambas, which is the farm, of all these local people. Overnight, everything gone. All the crops completely decimated. And these people were furious. They don't get support from government. They're promised financial support. They never see it, right? So they're furious, and they just want to see a little bit of, I don't, I don't really know, really. Their livelihoods have just been destroyed. So ultimately, they wanted these elephants dead, so they use fire, they use spears, they use everything they can to try and um, deter and kill these elephants. Um, these three elephants actually did get out alive, but this problem of conflict, I mean, this is one particularly extreme example but it happens every single day and in huge numbers across Kenya. So I went on an elephant translocation. This is one of the ways they try and mitigate this conflict. Essentially, what that means is they dart the elephant, they then put it on a truck, because I'm about to show you in this video, and then they move it a couple of hundred kilometers elsewhere. All right, so, I mean, when you see this, it's a little bit shocking. This is the largest land mammal on Earth, and it's hanging upside down in the air. Some kids are like, ah! So I'm like, start crying, I don't know, it's odd. Anyway, the whole thing was really, really distressing to see while I was there on the ground, and I had never seen this before. And this is what's going to shape my PhD. I went out there to write a proposal. I needed to find out what it would take to conserve a species, and I, I wrote it based on witnessing this. Um, important to note, this elephant uh, had been moved before. So there's fresh spear wounds in its ear from the night before. It's been detusked, which basically, I need more than 15 minutes to go through that, but essentially the front of its tusk has been cut off um, and it's been moved before and it's migrated its way back because it's an elephant and that's what elephants do. And, um, and now it's being moved to the other side of Nairobi so it can't migrate its way back. Is that an effective strategy? Does it work? Um, many questions and that's ultimately what I'm gonna be looking at for my PhD. Okay, we'll stop, on to the next. Conflict story, humpback whales and humans, how can they be conflicting? But there is conflict, and I learned about this when I went to Southeast Alaska in August, a wild and remote place. This is one of the largest tidewater glaciers in the whole of North America. It's epic, 72 miles from face to source, it's insane. Um, and it was really interesting to learn about how everything is really connected there. So this cute little harbor seal um, is using the icebergs. They get carved off this tidewater glacier. It's using it for safety away from predators. So the orca there that hunt these seals. Um, how else is everything connected? So as these icebergs are melting and going into the water, all these nutrients are entering the water from that were trapped initially in the ice. That then supports life, so small organisms like plankton and fish that then support larger life such as humpback whales and um, you've also got other amazing charismatic species like orca these are resident orca that feed on fish so different to transient that feed on um, marine mammals like seals and um, you've also got 
bears, so coastal brown bears and black bears that feed on the fish here. Now, Southeast Alaska is also very important um, in supporting um, uh, the salmon, sorry, the Pacific salmon run supports a huge, ra a huge range of life for the bears, so the black bears here. This black bear was a young black bear, and um, it was a little bit too early for salmon season. The salmon run was pretty late this year due to late rains. Um, that's a whole other talk in itself. But this juvenile bear is a bit like, I can smell it, but I don't really know how to hunt because I'm too young and I I'm, I'm don't really know what I'm doing, so I'm just going to sit on this rock and look around and pretend like no one's looking. Um, what I'm trying to say is that there's a huge range of charismatic species that are brought to these nutrient-rich waters every year, including humans. So in Southeast Alaska, the aquaculture industry here is huge. It brings in about 750 million pounds each year. So they have salmon hatcheries here. And um, the whole fishing industry, both for um, uh, the commercial fishing for salmon and herring, is really, really kind of rife there. Um, but the salmon hatcheries are put in place, essentially what they're there for is to stop the depletion of wild populations of salmon. So they have these hatcheries where they basically um, kind of let uh, the salmon develop until they're juveniles and they release them into the water. Um, they then make the salmon run and can support this huge, huge commercial fishing of these salmon. But what's happened is these humpback whales have learned that once these small juvenile salmon get released into the water, they pretty much leave the nets and go straight into the mouths of the humpback whales. So you've got a bit of a big problem. You can't go around translocating humpback whales. And the problem with these waters specifically is that there is a lot of humpback whales. So Southeast Alaska is very unique in that it's the only place in the world you'll see cooperative hunting of humpback whales, of up to 20 individuals. So you see bubble net feeding, and if you want to geek over bubble net feeding after, come find me and I'll tell you how it works. But I saw eight individuals here bubble net feeding, and essentially if you think about these baleen whales, these huge, huge whales, they all then sit in numbers around these hatcheries and engulf all, this, all these um, juvenile salmon that come out of these, these hatcheries, which is of course lost money. Amazing thing to see, this is um, an example of bubble net feeding of this cooperative group hunting. I'm going to have to hurry up. Um, but this humpback whale is feeding right by a hatchery here, and they come into really shallow waters where they're not really meant to. So the last story, um, I just want to touch on this because Kenya and Southeast Alaska are quite far-flung places from here, but this issue of human-wildlife conflict affects even us. I recently did a story, it was an undercover story, one of my own um, that I was told not to do because it may affect my career, but I thought this is a story that really needs to be told. It's again about the aquaculture industry, and it's based in Scotland. There is conflict over the salmon farms there and seals. Can you please put your hand up if you know that salmon farms shoot seals here in the UK? I don't see any. I see one hand. I don't know if you're joking with me, but it's up. One hand. Salmon farms shoot um, seals here in the UK. It's a similar problem, right? So the problem there is that the salmon, the, basically the seals are coming along, seeing these huge pens, which are essentially bowls of food for the seals to eat. They're, go, they're kind of coming up to these pens and they're like, hello, that's my food, thank you very much, like breakfast. Um, they come along, they then eat the nets, open the nets, that's all that, that money gone out into the ocean or being eaten by these seals. So it's cheaper and easier to shoot a seal if it becomes what's called a problem seal um, around these farms. And that was a project of mine. Like I said, I was discouraged from doing it because it's really risky, but I felt it was a story that needed to be told. I went up to Shetland after getting a call from um, a local person who basically said, you need to come up, we've just found washed up dead seals, which was the first evidence that I needed to put together the evidence to kind of tell people about this. Um, it's a real passion project of mine, and then I made a video and I put it online to try and raise awareness of this issue. And I wasn't just doing it to create waves, really this was about changing policy. And it all comes under this umbrella of how we manage our relationships with our wildlife. I want to see the shooting of seals in Scotland and in Shetland stopped. There may be things in place um, at the moment as a result of this film to make that happen, which is brilliant to hear. But the best thing about it is there are effective alternatives to shooting seals. It's called double netting, which is just put a second net. Problem is it costs a lot of money. And that's when you come into this, um, this issue of, yeah, I guess that culture industry not wanting to pay, but this for me was a closer story to home. Um, it's a story that I feel very passionately about, and I think it's all into this realm of 
how we manage those relationships and this issue of human wildlife conflict. And going forward in the future, I believe this issue of human wildlife conflict is going to be one of our biggest challenges in conservation for you, for us, for everyone in this room. It affects us all. So please just go away and think about whether we can coexist alongside wildlife for the future and think of ways that we can try and better exactly that. Thank you very much for listening.